industrial park uh, that have higher optical densities as farmland. So we can see that this farmland that has 15 years of use of glyphosate has less optical densities as the other ones. So we can see that there is a, an environmental and anthropogenic activity impact on these community soils. In addition, we can see that depending of this origin of soils, we have uh, so we, we can see some differences between the use of different carbon sources by these microbial communities. For example, in the industrial park for, from 1, 100, we can see that they use more the polymers than in the natural reserve, and then, then you can see that, than for example, here in the farmland. Uh, in addition, we can see how as the days goes, we can see the activity is higher in mostly most of the cases here. Uh, we, we can see how they can react after the time. In B, in the 1000 dilution, we can see a similar response as the other one, but, but as you can see in farmland, we, we cannot see a good response. Um, from the microbial community. So this is an environmental impact from glyphosate in this area. As the same way, when you can see here from carboxylic acids, amino acids, amines, phenolic compounds, this is from one, a 100 dilution. And we can see here from D1 to D5 that uh, in right, this you have one minute case, left. phenolic compounds, uh, excuse me, the uh, phenol compounds in this case, in this case carboxylic, and in this case amino acids, you, we have the higher optical densities in. Uh, uh, here we can see farmland, for example, that is the lower values that we can see that. So according to the European Soil Data Center, uh, soil biodiversity is the variation in soil life of which they are part from microhabitat to landscapes. In this context, microbial metabolic response obtained provides information very important to determine that there is an impact from anthropogenic sources made on soils. In addition, we can see that long-term application of glyphosate influence microbial diversity and community, compos and community composition because the reaction from differences or, or different uh, carbon sources are lower than the other ones. And uh, these communities show, these communities show ex or exhibit differences in adaptation through time when they must use specific carbon sources. So we can uh, use that information that is easy to use, that is faster to use, that use a low amount of sample, uh, we can see uh, the microbial community response. So results indicate that ecoplate can be used to monitor change in soil microbial communities over time using carbon uh, source, different carbon source of the, in these communities. Uh, we gave evidence of changing soils where anthropogenic activities are on it, and the extensive herbicide use is an example of that. The example indicates that the adaptation period of microbes is higher than the ones in natural environments, uh, rather than the anthropogenic activity uh, source. Uh, here we have uh, an additional future, future work to determine how additional carbon of anthropogenic sources can be used as food for microbes. For microbes, so we we are using this information in this moment to determine specifically specifically uh, how much time the soil is uh, recovered uh, when when you use different um, contaminants of or pollutants or pesticides in different environments. So in this moment we are using uh, we are using this technique to different sources of contamination or pollution in soils and determine what is the response of this community. So for uh, engineers as I, this information was important because as a direct bio 
uh, impact we determine what happened in the soil. So thank you very much. This was my um, team that we what when when I work at La Salle community at the Lewis University and these guys who helped me in the project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Gonzalez. I think your evaluation work clearly indicated how human activity influenced the soil microbial community. We believe the knowledge we have learned today from this study can largely facilitate monitoring changes in the soil microbial community over the time. Thank you very much. So now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Bruso. He's going to tell us a, a very advanced concept to monitor biodiversity in agricultural soils, please. So, do you see my screen? Yes, go ahead, please. This is great. So, uh, good morning to everybody. I'm uh, Luigi Boruso. I'm a researcher at the Free University of Bol uh, Bolzano in Italy, in South Tyrol. And today I'm going to go to talk about uh, the ecological network analysis to assess the soil health and, uh, and soil quality, specifically in agricultural environments. Basically, what we know regarding soil biodiversity. Soil biodiversity, and particularly soil microbes, are playing a critical role in plant health and productivity. And basically, we know that any modification of this soil biodiversity in agricultural environment and agricultural soil can somehow even affect the above ground productivity of the plants. So that means uh, crop yield uh, and crop health and so on. However, what are the different parameters or the different factors can, that can uh, drive uh, the soil composition and that then can affect the soil diversity? First of all, we know the physical chemical characteristics, the presence, absence of chemical contaminants, the difference between the local environmental condition, that means uh, um, humidity, temperature, and so on, the land use practices, for example, uh, in, in case of the agricultural environment, the, the, the type of uh, agricultural practices, but uh, uh, something that is really important even are the interactions be among the different organisms. So basically the biodiversity, it's even, uh, defined by the different interactions between the organisms themselves and between the uh, different species themselves. And first of all, how, I mean, what is a good tool, a suitable tool in general to study, to explore the soil diversity? In the last few years, one of the most uh, uh, common uh, tools, or I mean, something that now it's nowadays it's quite not it's not used routinely, but it's becoming uh, more and more used by different research groups, is the study of environmental DNA. With this approach, it's possible to study the soil biodiversity. Uh, using, uh, let's say, um, a quite uh, standardized approach. Basically, what you do in this type of approach, I take my soil sample, and from that soil sample, I can uh, extract the DNA. And with that DNA, with that extracted DNA, I can study, I can analyze the different actors within the soil diversity. That means that I can, from the same soil sample, I can, uh, uh, I can analyze uh, I don't know, the bacterial species, uh, the presence of fungi or other organisms such as uh, nematodes, uh, arthropods and whatever. And uh, in this principle, we can say that basically there is a correlation between the genetic material found in the soil and the presence and abundance of that specific uh, organism. And, uh, um, and basically, this is quite a good, uh, let's say, strategy for different reasons. I mean, the use of environmental DNA approach. First of all, because I can target more than one species with the same samples. So within the same soil samples, and I can study different organisms, bacteria, fungi, and nematodes, whatever. 
it's a, it has already, these techniques, it has already been uh, uh, used for different environments, not only soil, but even water environment, sediments, uh, and even air. Usually these types of techniques, I mean, this type of approach, it can, it can be characterized by a low environmental disturbance. So I need just a few, a really low amount of samples, no more than two, three grams to study the diversity with this approach. It's for, of course, less time consuming than the classical survey, the classical approach. Why? Because in this case, really, I can work uh, in, uh, if I have a really well standardized pipeline and protocols, I can even work uh, in parallel just in a, a short time, even with more than 300 samples. And these types of approach would be not, I mean, with the traditional process, that would be not possible because, I mean, to work with a huge amount of samples, you really need a lot of people and a lot of different experts. And finally, this approach, it's really useful even to detect the rare species that somehow are not classified, are not found with the traditional approach, but they can be only found with this type of approach. And this, and the detection of rare species can be useful because sometimes, even though they are with a rogue, they are present in the environment with a low concentration, they can have anyway have an important role in soil function. Okay, but up to now, I'm talking about how to study the different actor of soil diversity. But going back uh, to the first slides, now today I would like to explain you, to give you an overview and how we can study the interactions between the different actors within uh, our soil. And one uh, approach that we proposed here is to use the agroecological networks what is an agroecological network? An agroecological network is something that is used to describe the interactions between different organisms within the soil. And when I talk about the different the interactions with, uh, of, uh, between among different organisms, I'm not talking about uh, uh, interaction only between organisms uh, belong to the same group. That means. Uh, that mean, I don't know, bacteria with bacteria, but even the interactions between bacteria, insect, bacteria, nematodes, fu fu fungi, bacteria, and so on. So it, the interactions even on uh, different, I mean, the interkingdom interactions. And why this approach is important? For different reasons, because I think that, I mean, we think that when you study uh, soil diversity, it's, it's really important not to study only the species itself, but it's really important to study all the interactions. And specifically with this network analysis, somehow using uh, specific statistic tools, we can understand what are the positive interactions between organisms and even negative interactions. Here, for example, we have uh, a quite simplified network in which we have our nodes that uh, can be considered like the species, the interactions. In red, we have the negative interactions. So one species, uh, we have a negative interactions so one one one, that one, uh, one species is negative correlated with another one and we have positive interactions when uh, so the green line when one species it's positively correlated with another one so what is the meaning to to do this type of studies because sometimes for example if we know in our environment that we have some bacteria that it's really important for some, I, I don't know, for the, the plant growth, for example, we have some uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria that can be useful for agricultural purposes. If we understand what are the other components uh, the other species that uh, uh, play, that increase or that have a positive interaction with that bacteria itself useful, I don't know, for crop uh, production, we can act uh, uh, we can promote the presence of that bacteria, even promoting the presence of other organisms that uh, uh, increase the presence of the, um, of the species itself. Here we, we have we have just I want just to show you some preliminary results of a study that we are carrying out here in South Europe in, in northern Italy. We analyzed something like 300 soil samples of different samples, and here I have quite a, quite a really um, simplified network in which I only consider bacteria and fungi. But on the other hand, at the moment we are even analyzing other organisms like nematodes, insects, and art and spiders and so on. But at the moment I can. I mean, uh, um, I have 
I can show only you the analysis of, of the interactions between bacteria and fungi. And what we have found, basically the moment we have found uh, 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 that of course there are a lot of a lot of interactions between bacteria and fungi as expected. But what is interesting that we found more positive, more negative interactions in conventional apple orchard than in the organic apple orchard. That is something that I cannot at the moment, we cannot say that is something of good or it's bad. It's just that we found this, uh, this difference between one type of agricultural practices and the other one. So as a take home message, uh, uh, what, why we think and what I want to say uh, regarding the importance of this agroecological network analysis and this environmental approach, that it's important to study the diversity of the soil diversity, but it's really even important to explore and to understand really well the species species interactions and the species soil interactions why? Because still, if I want to promote the presence of some organisms can, that can be useful for our soil and maybe that can have a good role for uh, crop yield, it's even important to find all the actors, all the other members that can help uh, the growth of the organism itself. Then the, to identify the key drivers, a keystone species that can influence this biodiversity. So it's important to understand what um, promote the presence of these organisms. And in general, if we can have this overview about the soil biodiversity, in the future, maybe we could even find a way to promote uh, uh, the presence of uh, beneficial organisms for uh, soil production, and maybe to find a way to reduce the, use, the usage of external inputs like fertilizer, pesticides, and so on. Um, I, for this work, I would like to, of course, I would like to, to acknowledge, uh, to say thanks to my colleagues uh, from University of Bolzano, from University of, of Essex, and from Oracruzor, of um, Oracruzor. Thank you very much uh, uh, to listen to me. If you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Grosso. Uh, I really liked uh, your, this idea about the uh, uh, connecting all the factors in uh, in the soil uh, biodiversity, and uh, nothing is uh, individually existing in our soil. So you introduce the machine learning and all the data mining technique concept into the soil biodiversity. Me as a as a data scientist, I really enjoyed this concept. I believe there will be a lot of questions waiting for you. Later we can discuss more. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, first of all, I'm. I, I didn't want to spend a lot of time about the, the techniques because uh, I mean, it, it, I think that we, we would need uh, like one hour just to talk about next generation sequencing, uh, machine learning techniques, just to say that now it's really important, all these interdisciplinary studies. So I think that nowadays it's important to work as a, I mean, sure. a, a microbiologist. Can, I mean, we uh, need so, to merge all the... Yeah, sure. So, uh, sorry, Mr. Bruso. We, we, later, we will have a, have a time to uh, interaction with all the audience. Now we have to give the floor to the uh, next uh, speaker, uh, okay. Mr. Uh, Marin. Uh, he will talk some work uh, was carried out by South, South American Research Network. Please. Uh, thank you, Yi. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Cesar Marin and I will present um, this presentation about the South American Mycorrhizal Research Network, uh, which is a, a network specialized in the mycorrhizal symbiosis and which I lead uh, for um, four years now. So in our, net, in our network, we have about 255 members from 38 countries <clears throat> this is sort of a very informal network because you just have to send like a, a an email to, to join. So it's, it's not so difficult. And we have several places in the continent which I consider that are the main laboratories or the main uh, groups working in, in the symbiosis. Uh, in Bariloche, Cordoba, uh, in Argentina, Pernambuco, 
en Brasil, Bogotá en Colombia, en Concepción, Temuco y, Val, y Valdivia en Chile. So, our, net, our network started around 2016 with the organization of um, a molecular community ecology course in, in, in specialized in arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Um, after that, we have done two, two South American symposiums in, in, in Valdivia, 2017, and in Bariloche, 2019. Um, so this keep grow, growing and growing, and, and, and we are also connected to several um, research and policy partners, partners worldwide like Soil Bone, like uh, the Global Soil Partnership, like the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative. And also one of the main things that we do is outreach. I, I consider that outreach is quite important. And we have this monthly uh, video blogging in YouTube where we interview um, different authors or, or main authors of, of papers, of recent papers on, on, on mycorrhizal research. So why specifically a South American mycorrhizal research, research network? Well, through different papers, we have found that that entire plants or, or soil types or, or fungi of entire biomes and countries in the continent are not studied. Like um, Paraguay, for example, it has very little samples in different reviews that we have done. Also, there is no continental or multilateral funding available, like in Europe, for example. And also I think that we need a strong training in, in sampling and molecular and bioinformatic and statistic methods. Also, there is something more conceptual regarding that there is no a full integration between mycorrhizal diversity or the concepts of, or of mycorrhizal diversity and the related ecosystem functions. And also we need still to regulate and, and study deeply all the mycorrhizal applications, specifically biofertilizers. As part of the network, eh, <coughs> Marcela Pagano and Monica Lugo, two, two years ago, they eh, published this eh, Springer book, which is the first book on mycorrhizal fungi in South, in South America. And uh, through this book, we can get a sense of, of how things are. For example, in chapter four, um, the authors, they took uh, two different approaches to analyze ectomycorrhizal biodiversity, uh, which is um, approaches with morphological methods and also with um, molecular methods. So they found similar results with both approaches. They found that similar dominant ectomycorrhizal lineages were present in both approaches, Cortinarius, Boletus, Rusula. And they found that the Patagonian Notophagus forest uh, has by far the highest uh, biodiversity of, of this uh, mycorrhizal type. In another chapter, uh, when analyzing the uh, biodiversity of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, the authors found 186 species, which is around 60% of the global biodiversity of this very important group. And as you can see in the map, there are plenty of regions, like for example, in the Amazonas and in the Cerrado in Brazil and in the Patagonian Pampa, which have no, no a single sampling point. So still we need, we need a lot of work to do. Also in, in a chapter that I am co-author, we found, we analyzed um, the mycorrhizal types for a specific region in Southern Chile. And, and we found that uh, from 248, 45 species, most of them are arbuscular mycorrhizal, but this, uh, this kind of analysis of, of mycorrhizal types is necessary in all the, the forest types and in all the vegetation types, because we just know about 5% of, of, of uh, which uh, mycorrhizal type is associated to the roots of, of different species. Also regarding some ecosystem services, 
um, in my own uh, research regarding um, bio, regarding again temperate forests in, in southern Chile. In my doctoral thesis, we found uh, this process of, of biogenic weathering of parent material uh, by mycorrhizal fungi. So the IFP kind, kind of enters the mineral, in this case, uh, muscovite and also apatite, and degrades this mineral and releases these nutrients into the soil. Also, <clears throat> there is a, a strong research focus in, in, in Chile as well, regarding how arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and specifically glomalin, the glomalin protein gives cereals the tolerance to extremely high levels of aluminum in the soil and extremely low levels of, of available phosphorus, which are common conditions in, in, in this kind of soils. Um, a final word, uh, maybe during this symposium you will see uh, this research in soil bond, which is the Global Soil Biodiversity Observation Network. Uh, last year and this year, we published two important uh, articles, uh, one in Nature Communications and one in Science, showing in the Nature Communications one that regarding macroecological studies of, of soil, most of, se several of them study soil biodiversity and several of them study ecosystem functions in soil, but just 0.3% of, of all these studies uh, study both things at, at the same time, meaning biodiversity and, and ecosystem functions. And this is uh, not good because obviously both things are uh, interdependent. So in the next, in the next uh, article in science, we propose a series of essential biodiversity variables on how to deal with this, this disconnect and how to study at the same time soil biodiversity and, and ecosystem functions. So, so I encourage uh, to look uh, at these papers. And that's for, from my side. Uh, I, I want to thank to the dozens of people that, that, has, uh, that have helped me in, in this network, in this South American Microreserve Research network and just to announce that we are already planning a third symposium in the Amazon in 2023 because of the pandemic we have to delay this one year but in 2023 uh, we will have this in the Colombian Amazon and that's it thanks thank you very much uh, Mr. Marie we really appreciate all the work that has been done by you and uh, your colleague and uh, if uh, you need any help and support from uh, GSP and FAO, please feel free to reach us out. Uh, we believe you have done tremendous work in uh, Latin America. Thank you. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Uh, Ledesma. He will talk a regional study which was done in Bolivia, Amazon, please. Good morning, everybody. Um, you can show my presentation. I can show you my presentation. Good morning and afternoon, everybody. Uh, connected in the Global Symposium of Soil Biodiversity and a warm greeting to our moderator, Dr. Yi Peng. I am pleased to present the first evaluation in South America of the Soil Biolog Biological Quality Index, QBSR, a pilot study in the Bolivian Amazon. Uh, my name is Sergio Ledesma. I am working in FAO Bolivia. I was coordinator of the program Straining Community Social Economy Through Comprehensive and Sustainable Forest Management for the Bolivian Amazonia, call it HISBA. Carry out from 2017 to 2021 as an initiative um, of the local Ministry of Environment and Water, Italian Cooperation and FAO in Bolivia. Today, I am also with the presence of Dr. Rodriguez in the Laboratorio Boliviano de Biota y Desarrollo. The Bolivian Amazon Basin extends over 700,000 square kilometers with a population that reaches more than 2 million inhabitants, where there are 22 indigenous nations, 517 communities, and whose area of influence of the program, of the GISBA program, was co covered more than 135 communities in 14 municipalities, in two departments, Pando and Beni. The program HISBA in Bolivia initially focused on, the, on one of the main wild products of the forest, 
with the so-called tree of Bertolesia excelsa with an incomparable nut, which in the last five years uh, from Bolivia, we exported $825 million for the sale of 123,000 of tons. In this framework, uh, the GISLA program proposed the development of a study on environmental functions, not only about biodiversity in Amazonian soils, but also related to the pollinators of this nut, pollen and integral management related to forest management instruments and productive community enterprises. The invisible voice of silent organisms in Bolivian Amazons are presented in the first evaluation in South America of the Soil Biological Quality Index, UBSR, a pilot study in Bolivia, e, and the soil mesofauna classified by size comprised organisms whose body size range from zero that one millimeter to two millimeters wide and represent an abundant and diverse group with greater dependence on conditions below the surface compared to macrofauna or megafauna and does not require as much instrumentation for study compared to microfauna. According to estimates, the activity of soil biodiversity can generate $1,542 trillion a year but it also means, as initially mentioned, an important income for pigeons and indigenous communities that use and comprehensive manage uh, for the forest. Species identification is a difficult step in any group of soils animals. In this sense, some soil biota analysis methods do not depend so much on the identification of the species. This is the case of the QBSR index. Several countries measures different biologicals parameters of the soil on a national or re regional scale with tens to thousands of sample points, including the QBS. There are different soil biological indicators based on different soil groups from bacteria to macrofauna. In 2001, uh, Parisi in Italia proposed a biological quality index based on microarthropods. Parisi proposed uh, soil categories according to the values of the QBSR index. But is it proposed for each uh, soil group according to the morphological adaptation to the life in the soil constitutes an ecomorph and each type of ecomorph with each group as has a specific value. The QBS index uh, assign, assign ecomorphological indices or EMI to the presence of each main group among the soil microarthropod mesofauna that poses certain morphological characteristics associated with a greater or lesser adaptation to life in the soils. These groups are called, are called ecomorphs. Some groups such as Colembola have different ecomorphs and each one of has a different value that is issued in the QBS. The sum of the EMI summarizes a numerical value associated with the biological quality of the soil. A synthesis of the value of the ecomorphological indices can be made for each type of ecomorph of each soil group. A 2018 revision showed that all the countries the QBS are being used. Now the QBS index can be used from well-preserved forest soils, native grasslands to area of initiatives cultivation. Our work was developed in three communities in the Northern Amazon of Bolivia in the middle of South America associated with the harvest of Amazonian nuts. They were evaluated in each community in two types of soils, as, as you can see in the slide. Uh, soils with the forest and disturbed soils close to the communities. In this slide, you can see uh, three, types of, three types of soils profiles that we find in the Bolivian Amazon. The profile show above on the left show an APO raisin with a higher container of organic matter that does not exceed 13 centimeters and where roots develop fine. The second horizon hardened and compact due to the change of land use for livestock. The bottom left profile of the Amazon peneplain reddish in color due to the to the highest levels of iron and aluminum without compaction and deeper root development and family. And finally, the bottom right profile that belongs to the alluvial soil with a dark color due to the sediments of alluvial origin. Our study the focus on the first two. In the present study carried out in Bolivia in three rural communities associated with the Amazon nut, Bertolesi excelsa, in a transition season, end of the rainy season, and we can see the, the samples uh, next, to the, next to the village of Sinai, no? call it Sinai. In the next slide, you can see the sample with Winkler extractor, one of, uh, of our methodology to extract this kind of information, and then the detail of the collection with the Winkler extractor. Then, um, and the Berles and the Winkler. No? 
and also the evaluation uh, made in the laboratory and also the hard conditions of the roads in Bolivia. The sample must be first be cleaned and separated from the soil debris and our results uh, may, uh, were to 15,000 individuals were evaluated. We observed trends according to each community and according to the type of structure, wrinkler or burglass, and the structure time, one day versus 14 days. We see the general trends about uh, abundance compared to between all groups. And also the ecomorph ecomorphological indices evaluated for the groups extracted with Winkler structure, structure and the QBS index obtained one day and 14 days comparison and the ecomorphological indices obtained from the Berles funnel and the comparison of the QBS index between forests and pastures. Summarizing of the QBS uh, index for the three communities, comparing forests and pastures, the, resource, the results after reviewing 15,000 individuals of different groups of microarthropods show high QBS index value in slight altered primary forest soils compared to lower values of the index in neighboring soils that are highly, highly altered by anthropogenic actions. Furthermore, there are quantitative differences between index value depending on whether Winkler structures high values or burlesque funnels lower values are used. Complementary results uh, are uh, making because in Bolivia we uh, found five previously known species in Bolivia. Now we have uh, 27 genera and 14 families. Now with the collaboration of Dr. Palacio Vargas from the UNAM Mexico. And also we have a, as a complementary results an illustrated guide about mesofauna and the use of the, of the QBS index. No, about all the uh, environmental functions, not just only the mesofauna uh, soil. As uh, next steps for us are the search of collaborators and resources to evaluate in other places in Bolivia, because it's the first study in this kind here. Then we are uh, in preparation about uh, different papers about the research, the research, and also the inclusion of the biological component in discussions about the project on a new law on soils in Bolivia. And in finally, the social socialization of the guys to the potential users. And also we participate in different workshops uh, here in, in Bolivia. No? For, our, for us, is, is our team uh, presented here, numerous of young professionals, bio, from entomologists, biologists, agronomists, uh, and also engineers of, uh, of the forest. But our team is uh, previously uh, the, our, the communities, no? as the main and, and the main conclusion I can, and can I have to say is this: it's a metal note about the biology of the South America mesofauna. But the QBS index could be a low-cost alternative for the evaluation and monitoring of the biological quality of soil in South America in this kind of condition conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ledesma. Uh, we really appreciate uh, our colleague from FAO colleague from Bolivia. You have done tremendous amount of the work. And uh, since uh, we don't have that much time left, I suggest that we direct, directly go to the question and uh, answer session. And uh, I saw a few quite interesting questions in uh, chat during the presentation. So we can first start with uh, a question speaker maybe the question for the second speaker mr brusso and i think there is a question asking mr brusso are you here yeah yeah uh, okay there is a question said that uh, i agree the procedure is straightforward but what about the challenges and the difficulties of interpreting those complex network analysis yeah this is a quite interesting question basically uh, the idea is that uh, with this network analysis, uh, the point that, I mean, the best approach is to, st to start with, uh, let's say, with not really complicated uh, so, um, environment and then to increase the complexity of the environment. Let's say, uh, for example, when I work with agricultural soil, basically, um, of course, it will be easier to work uh, and to build an agroecological network in an agricultural soil instead of in a natural soil. Why? Because usually in agricultural soil, we have less biodiversity than in a forest soil or in, another natural, or in another natural soil. So the idea is why I think that the, 
I mean, to study agricultural, I mean, to use the, um, the approach of network analysis in agricultural soil can be useful for the agricultural environment itself, but even uh, useful in the future to use the same approach for more complex environment. Because when I work with agricultural soil, usually still I don't have a huge diversity compared to other types of uh, environment. Uh, compared to other types of soils. So if I test my agroecological network in a, a quite um, simple or less, co less complex environment, then I can use it even in more uh, complex environments. So the idea that from my perspective, uh, the idea uh, that I don't expect to have a so complex network in an agricultural soil instead of other type of environment. I don't know if it, that was clear, the answer. So okay. Th yeah. yeah, thank you very much. I think the, your, so, uh, I think your, your work and this concept is quite interesting, even very interesting for me as well. I think, could you please later also uh, leave your email or contact yeah. in the chat so people can easily reach you. Yeah, yeah, Otherwise, yeah. Uh, we will spend all the day to discuss these interesting questions. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and uh, the next uh, speaker, uh, uh, first, I want to ask if uh, Mr. Gonzalez is still here. Come, Ms. Gonzalez. Okay, she's still not here. And then the third speaker is uh, Mr. Uh, Cesar uh, Marin. Uh, I don't, I don't see that much uh, specific question uh, for you, uh, Mr. Cesar Marin. I think yes, I don't see that much. Uh, I don't see that much uh, specific question for you, but I read a little bit about your abstract and you mentioned that uh, there, need, there is a need to build a full picture uh, for, for this uh, productive system for the whole South uh, uh, American. I'm just wondering, uh, could you please uh, use this platform? I think, uh, could you please uh, express a little bit of your difficulties and the challenges of your facing the work? Well, yes, thank you Yi, for, for the question. Um, I think that we don't have any multi multilateral funding and also uh, because of the lack of training uh, in, in different uh, molecular and statistical methods. Uh, as I show in my presentation, there are entire biomes and entire countries uh, not, not studied in, in our continent. So this is the main challenge I think uh, we have regarding mycorrhizal research. And I, I would say that not just in, in, in South America, but also uh, in Africa and uh, Southwest uh, Asia, in, in several places. So. I think that what we need to do is to integrate ourselves to global initiatives and to global projects, something that we are currently doing, uh, but still we, we need way more. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think the as I said, the, we, uh, we like what you have done. We really appreciate what you have done for the South American. If you need any help, uh, if you think any help can from uh, FAO or Global Soil Partnership, you are very welcome to reach us and uh, we will do our best uh, to help you. And uh, the last uh, question will go to uh, Mr. Ledesma. There is a question asked, uh, are the dark soil, uh, terra preta soil also as uh, Amazon dark earth? I don't know if this question is clear for you or not. Uh, yes, uh, as, uh, as, I can, as, can, as I can answer about dark soils, no, in the work was not evaluated if the soil analyzed were in correspondence with the specific definition of terra petra, preta. No, we found our, um, our samples where, where there are the, the Brazilian nuts uh, plants, not trees. So we made uh, this kind of, of sampling, no? not uh, evaluating the correspondence with this definition of Terra Petra, Dr. Yipeng. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, um, I'm sorry, we will not have that much time to uh, in the stay in the life discussion. Uh, so I think uh, we can 
it is a time to start the second part of this session. And then later on, when we finish the next four presentation, if we still have time, we can continue our discussion if everybody is still interested. And the second part of this is actually we have an interest for uh, urban biodiversity in uh, urban agriculture in various forms. Um, we conduct uh, several projects on urban agriculture, um, especially in urban vegetable garden, in cultivated green roof, and uh, also in urban micro farming. And uh, I would like to present you the um, different approach we conduct on, uh, on soil biodiversity in urban micro farming, and especially about the method uh, developed in order to evaluate uh, ecosystem services in urban micro, micro farming. So um, I don't know if you uh, already seen some uh, urban soil. Um, it's uh, quite different from natural soil or pseudo natural soil. Uh, we can have some uh, um, this kind of soil, can be soil or entro soil with different uh, layer, uh, but we have also um, constructed techno soil, which are very anthropogenic with uh, a lot of um, technogenic element. Um, and uh, sometimes it's only uh, anthropogenic element, like for example, compost or a kind of, uh, of soil. Um, so we have a lot of questions about uh, the soil biodiversity in this uh, different soil type in, uh, in urban soil. Um, and especially we have a concern about uh, the development of uh, urban agriculture in France, um, which um, increased this uh, uh, last year, uh, especially in big cities like Paris. And uh, we have also a development of new form uh, like green roof, uh, vegetable green roof, and uh, some kind of uh, urban farm uh, conducted on polluted soil. So we have a lot of questions about the soil biodiversity in this uh, different form. So we um, choose to conduct a uh, transdisciplinary project about um, urban micro farming and biodiversity was study, uh, but also with other um, ecosystem services I don't uh, show you, of course, a result about these uh, various uh, ecosystem services, but um, we'd like to uh, show you it's uh, very important to have this kind of uh, transdisciplinary approach in uh, urban soil, because um, for the urban soil, uh, we need to manage with uh, human activities, um, and uh, we have also some concern about uh, this techno soil functioning. Uh, so we need to have uh, this different part of ecosystem services studies. So for the next um, slide, I will present you only uh, the part about biodiversity, but the development um, was the same for other ecosystem services. That means um, we study two kinds of ecosystem services. Uh, we study um, ecosystem services provide to farmer, to the farmer, the food production, for example. But for the soil biodiversity, it's not uh, only for the farmer. It's not only useful to, to have um, organic matter recycling and uh, food production. It's also uh, useful for the multifunctionality of urban soil. So we have benefit for the farmer, but also benefit for the south city. In order to test our method, we uh, follow several sites, um, seven urban micro farm in uh, Paris center. Um, there was a uh, urban micro farm on the green roof. Um, this green roof is our uh, experimental green roof uh, conducted on uh, our school. And we follow also other um, green roof uh, with food production. For example, this site is um, a site uh, developed on um, elementary school, and students uh, go to this uh, green roof in order to uh, 
to cultivate the vegetable. And here it's uh, another form of uh, urban micro farming. It's uh, a um, green roof in order to uh, insert uh, people without work and they uh, sell uh, the different food production. We have a great variety uh, between these different sites because we have uh, mostly, no, we have only concentrated soil, but uh, they was created uh, for the holders uh, in uh, 2012 and uh, recently uh, in uh, 2016. And even for the cultivated area, it's very viable between uh, 80 to uh, 400 uh, square meter. We follow also um, urban micro farm at the best one soil, uh, four sites three uh, without uh, soil uh, contamination and one um, where they have uh, still um, soil contamination. They try to produce on soil uh, contamination. Um, we have also a variety of uh, function of this uh, urban agricultural form. Uh, some of them are conducted in um, uh, high school and uh, some of them is uh, more associative um, urban agriculture uh, with a lot of, um, of um, free uh, worker and uh, some uh, paid uh, worker. Um, this uh, urban micro farm on Balwon are more um, large uh, because we have uh, at least um, in cultivated area 1,000 Square meter, and we don't have uh, only techno soil. We have mostly pseudo natural soil. Um, we collect data thanks to um, participative method um, on the field and in laboratory. It's the same thing for other ecosystem services. Uh, we, I think, we lost my. Hello, I think we lost your slide. Yes, okay. Uh, I think it's go back. Yes. Um, so for bioindicator of soil quality, we uh, follow uh, plants. And for uh, soil uh, biodiversity, we follow microorganism, columbola, macrofauna, and we also uh, use the um, participatory uh, sciences the TBAC index in order to know if uh, we can compare this result of um, TBAC index uh, decomposition with other um, value obtained by the uh, initiative. So in, um, concerning the result, um, we find, of course, we have a illustrative site with a, a high viability. And is the same thing for um, the different uh, value of biodiversity. We have a high virality between sites. Uh, for example, you have results for um, plants. Um, we have a lot of viability. We have common species. Uh, it's the same thing for soil biodiversity. But also, we notice a high virality inside the site. Um, even if we have the same uh, microhabitat, for example, um, the part where we have food production, um, we have variation between uh, the different part of food production or the different part of uh, grassland, for example. So we have a high viability. And um, we notice effect uh, to differences between um, urban micro farming conducted on green roof and urban micro farming conducted at background soil. And this difference um, you have one are, left. Yeah, are not the same uh, between um, the different uh, urban micro farm. Uh, we notice, for example, um, we have more microorganisms and like colobola in the green roof than um, S form of plants uh, in bad ground. And we try to compare to reference value, and uh, it was the limit of our um, system. Uh, because um, we don't know where we can uh, compare this data. 
is we compare to uh, national value, where is uh, compared to um, garden uh, values. For example, we try to do, do that for uh, Colombola. But in fact, we have a very high lack of reference value in urban soil and uh, in urban agriculture. So this limits the development of uh, evaluating ecosystem services or soil biodiversity health um, in, uh, in cities. And we need also to take into account dynamic, uh, temporal dynamics or spatial dynamics because always in uh, cities is often uh, one point to, uh, for example, in, uh, in the winter or uh, no, in the spring, um, but uh, we don't know how it's uh, um, evaluated uh, during this year. So if you want to uh, know better urban soil biodiversity, we need to understand better the uh, characteristic uh, in function of urban soil, but also to uh, have a reference value. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jomi. Uh, it, it was very interesting presentation. And as you mentioned, there's a lack of the reference menu. I think uh, probably it is also the time to consider, uh, propose a project to build this uh, reference system, uh, reference value system, and then the world can, can use this one and to learn from this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Brown from Brazil. He will tell us something about uh, their simulation work, but this simulation is not in the computer. So let's listen, please, Mr. Brown. Okay, thank you very much. I am now sharing my screen. I hope you can all see that. Yes, go ahead. Great, um, thank you, Yi and Julia and the FAO and all of you for being here this afternoon morning, evening, wherever you are. So I can share with you some of the work which we have been doing. It's this, uh, actually the work of a former PhD student of mine, Talita Ferreira, done, uh, who is now currently a postdoc with us, also done with the collaboration of Luis Cunha and many other colleagues, both in Brazil and, and the United Kingdom, and also partly funded by a uh, Royal Society grant. So I'll be speaking about uh, Amazonian soils, um, but I will be speaking about a particular soil on the Amazon and actually it's simulation. As you know, many of the soils in the Amazon are, are generally acid and of low fertility, tend to be highly weathered and with high contents of aluminum iron oxides. And um, they generally tend to be quite different from those produced by um, centuries of colonization or occupation by Amerindians uh, who over time by addition of organic materials, organic residues, excrements, uh, bone and uh, lithic artifacts, potsherds and so forth created what are called the Amazonian dark earths. And these were created from top down, i.e. Um, contrary to pedogenesis, typical pedogenesis. And uh, they were created on top of the same parent materials, the low, many of the low fertility um, soils, but yet these have very high and resilient fertility. And as you look here in this picture that shows some maize growing on adjacent soils, typical uh, Amazonian soils and Amazonian dark earths on the right, you can see it really is a bumper crop. And these are uh, really, um, the objective is to how can we recreate these soils in order to uh, help sustainability and agriculture productivity in not only in the Amazon, but throughout the tropics. So we decided to go through and looking at the ingredients, how could we recreate what is called um, the Terra Preta Nova as simulated Amazonian dark earth with those components. So including plant remains, animal remains, excrements, biochar, and um, some of the other ingredients such as pottery and even soil biota. Uh, much of the work done with Amazonian dark earths has actually been in the chemical aspect. So showing it's much higher fertility, mainly in the chemistry, but yet um, the soil biota had been uh, quite neglected until more recently with um, much of the microbiological work showing very different communities. But then even more recently, 
uh, soil, uh, animal soil zoology showing that actually earthworms were a very important component of these Amazonian dark earths and tend to be uh, major bioturbators and, and contribute to the genesis of these soils. So we decided we would test the uh, individual components and their different combinations with earthworms uh, in, in, the, in the greenhouse and look at plant production and soil fertility in a nutrient poor oxisol, sort of recreating a terra preta. And we hypothesized that the combination of all of those components would result in the best impacts on soil fertility and plant production. So here's a picture of the greenhouse experiment that had around 160 pots with four kilos of soil. We took maize as the test plot, test plant up to flowering, and we did this in a fractional factorial, so it didn't, com didn't constitute all of the different uh, combinations, but most of them. And we uh, then included earthworms in uh, half the treatment, so five earthworms per pot. We put fish uh, bone meal to an equivalent of around 500 ppm of phosphorus. We added manure as a, a organic and excrement material. It, in, in order to reach 2.6% carbon in the soil. And we added pot sherds and biochar at a 10% weight by weight uh, um, uh, uh, proportion. And we looked at the soil fertility, we looked at the soil microbiome of the rhizosphere, and then we looked at the plant, the height, the shoot and root biomass, the root uh, volume, and the also plant root and shoot microbiome. And we did find, yes, that as you increase the number of components, there was a significant increase in the uh, production of maize. Yet, which were the components that were most important? So we went through and we did um, this looking at, uh, these are all the treatments with worms, for instance, and we clearly see on the left-hand side that organic matter and fishbone meal are really the two most important uh, stimulators for, um, for productivity. Yet, as you combine those, you see different effects, different interactions, whereas, fish bone plus organic matter uh, were really those that uh, combined produce the highest um, uh, in increases. And yet when you had all of them, for instance here, you see that it's not the same as when you have all of them without um, pottery, but yet there are then uh, in important in interactions and if effects which need to be looked at further. And yet this uh, whole, um, production is almost equal to that obtained with conventional fertilization as the control. So as we look at earthworms individually and we, we say, okay, let's look at all the, the treatments with earthworms, we found that there was a significant increase in both shoot and root biomass and particularly in root volume with earthworm pr uh, presence. And this is mainly, as we know from the literature and from what we see, effects on, on nutrient mineralization, the use of, of calcium carbonate from the calcium um, calciferous glands, the priming effect, especially on soil microorganisms and changes in the soil microbiome with uh, uh, beneficial effects on plant growth promoting rhizobacteria and the physical effects like such as the casts on the surface, the burrows, which many of the roots follow and their consequent effects on aggregates, uh, porosity, aeration, infiltration rates and so forth. But we also saw that earthworms in a laboratory experiment altered the biochar in those treatments. It, it functionized these biochars by changing its physical, chemical, and biological characteristics, including microbial colonization and, and breakdown of that biochar. And we, we look at organic matter and fish bone meal, the two main ones stimulating um, production. And we see here that above and below, below ground biomass increased from 60 to 70%, root volume 25%. And fish bone meal, um, again, uh, 60, 60 to 70% increase in dry uh, mass of root and shoots. And again, uh, around 20, 25% increase in root volume. And this is mainly due to the chemical enrichment of the soils. We look at the manure providing nitrogen, um, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, changing the pH and the base saturation. And we look at the fish bone meal changing again, um, nitrogen contents, um, phosphorus and calcium, especially as sources of, of, of nutrients. And therefore these being limiting in those soils were very, very important for in increasing plant growth. So as we, as we, oh no, um, as we looked at the interactions, we see that really there were a lot of two-way interactions, significant interactions on, in plant above and below ground mass. There were some three-way interactions and, and one significant four-way interactions. So there's a lot of things to be looked at 
And we believe that uh, further work is, is necessary, particularly to identify um, how this happens, which are the best interactions, and how can we then best recreate this terra preta uh, for plant production. And we are looking at this uh, particularly by transcriptomics and metagenomics, and we don't have these results yet. We should hope to present them soon. Looking at how these um, um, affect gene expression and plant productivity and soil fertility, focusing primarily on earthworm plant and microbe interactions. So we believe that yes, some of these old technologies are still uh, very uh, relevant today. Terra preta can be recreated, but we need some further research. This is just a, a one case scenario. We need to look at other crops. We need to look particularly at the best interactions, which are the best combinations. And we need to take them to a harvest phase, particularly in more field type experiments. We show that fish bone uh, and, and fresh organic matter excrements are very important, but that biological components such as earthworms are also important and have important interactions. And that uh, ADEs, therefore, these Tejapreta novas, are an in important and interesting model that we can take into consideration for development of sustainable agriculture and agroecological intensification. So I want to thank you for your attention and particularly um, uh, all the people who helped us out, both in setting up and taking down the experiment, the institutions involved, and those who helped fund the work. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown, and uh, thank you very much to uh, respect the time. And I think we even still have uh, one minute more left, but uh, I really liked your work. I think uh, we are looking forward to see this work uh, can be extended to the long-term and uh, larger scale experiment. Now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Mamani Hoya. She's going to talk about some evaluation work under greenhouse condition, please. Thank you, Mr. Hello, good morning. My name is Lisbeth Mamani Rojas. This is a this is my presentation, evaluation of PGP bacteria again, the Octone Solanis, the of Solanium tuberosum playing under green, greenhouse conditions. Uh, I work in uh, in a laboratory of ecología microbiana and biotechnology uh, de la Universidad Nacional Agraria La Molina in Lima, Perú. El sol. In first, the soil is essential recourse and, and vital part of the natural environment, in which most of the world food is produced according to FAUD 2015, where the great diversity of microorganisms on size that are part, that are part of the soils are the invisible ingredients of fertility. Uh, send the group of plants depend on the set of fusion performance by the same microorganisms that inhabit the root. Because when secreting a polysaccharide, they adhere to particles uh, salts, avoiding er erosion with regulation the hormonal balance of the plant, helping they cope with abiotic stressors and protein that against parasites and other pathogens. Uh, for example, uh, sol de sol, sol de plain de solanium tuberosum, diversity microorganisms, selection of uh, bacterial strains, uh, bacterial strains uh, against Rhizoctona solani. Objective, evaluate the antagonist effect of 11 uh, strains, uh, Bacillus, Sodomona, and Actinomycetos. Again, Rhizoctone solani in sexual seeds of potato cultivate Yungai for compits. Methodology that takes what's called up in greenhouse condition of laboratory, uh, laboratory de microbiología y ecología y biotecnología de la Universidad Nacional Agraria La Molina, uh, isolation bacterial. 
uh, bacterial strains of the rhizor first and phylor first of Solanium tuberosum were isolated from different regions of Peru, Puno, Cajamarca, Huancavelica, Huanuco, and Lima. Uh, strain bacterial laboratory uh, BAC uh, fixing MD, MD uh, student of Calvo. Uh, chemical fungicide venomins uh, used in, uh, in Peru uh, against the Soctonia, uh, control negative, uh, control positive the Soctonia solani. Uh, table one. Table, uh, table one is characteristic uh, characteristic de uh, the show the sample sounds characteristic of the lysor first and phylor first samples region of Solanium tuberosum. Uh, they string that were isolated with their respective plates, the department and province and their uh, falso chemical characteristic of the soil are observed. For example, uh, straight uh, bacterial BPP4, uh, type of sample, uh, phylor first, uh, department Huancavelica. Uh, uh, for BPP8, uh, phylor first, Lima. Uh, ACPP2, Phylor First, Huancavelica, uh, 2 ACPP4, Phylor First, Huanco, E5 ACPP5, uh, Rhizor First, Puno. Inoculation. Inoculation of bacteria of bacteria in uh, sexual seeds of Solanium tuberosus, strain bacterial. The select strains were sound at 28 uh, grados Celsius uh, by 24 hours for Bacillus and Pseudomona and Actinomycetus at 507 days. Uh, then a uh, colony was taken and seed inflate for each strain at 28. Uh, Great uh, Celsius uh, by 24 hours in shaker, uh, 150 RPM. Uh, then one milli millimeters of each bacterial brood in inoculated into each cell in, or plant the solanium tuberosum. Uh, and imagine uh, one disinfection of sexual seeds of Solanium tuberosum, the cultivar uh, Yungai por compis. Uh, what's proposed uh, Suniga 2012? Uh, uh, disinfection uh, is alcohol the 17th grade uh, with uh, hypochlorito at uh, 3%. Uh, then uh, imagine two emerging the Solanium tuberosum. Uh, their seeds were sown uh, at 0 0.5 uh, centimeters, did in a 2.7 centimeter three uh, germination uh, trait. After 25 uh, to 30, uh, date in emerging cylinder was obtained with a uh, four uh, three uh, lead. Uh, then transplanting uh, three uh, three cylinders uh, per bag and three uh, three liter volume. Uh, inoculation of bacteria brought in plants. Then uh, cylinder grow at 95 uh, days and raining with the cell bacteria. Uh, 
uh, inoculation of the Octonia solani in in este in solanium in plates the solanium tuberosus uh, disinfection and treatment of with for the group of the Octonia solani in group in the Octonia solani in vitro at uh, 305 days uh, by 28 uh, grade Celsius. A uh, piece of agar with fungi mycelium were placed in cooperation into with a uh, lead to incubate for uh, 305 days uh, by 28 grade Celsius. In fact, infection of sealant uh, with, with great infection with the Octonia solani. Uh, the the results and uh, discussions uh, table two and table two effects of three PGPR straight on the growth of potato plants under green conditions greenhouse conditions and treatment uh, three uh, strain bacteria uh, compared uh, with Benomil control uh, positive, control negative, uh, resultando uh, straight bacterial for BPP8 uh, con wheat fresh tubers, uh, wet uh, dry tubers. Mejor, mayor. Uh, el chandro uh, resultó la uh, straight uh, bacterial BPP4. Uh, uh, 19.9 en uh, plant health uh, uh, not significances no significances en uh, entre treatment uh, between treatments en containing chlorophyll uh, containing chlorophyll uh, el que tuvo mayor es el control negative uh, 45. Point uh, zero eight. You have one minute left. Ah, okay. Infection of the seed in the cell in plant the solanium tuberosus. Uh, uh, Stray bacterial major uh, for BPP8 and strain with grade of a small tuber on comparison with different treatment uh, for BPP8, Benomil, and Octonia solani control negative. Uh, the for BB8 strain of wheat 11.9 red of fresh wheat and 1.5 grams of dry tuber wheat. Uh, the BBP for strain was the enchantro site. The BBP for strain was the on the most reduced. Did the made for a uh, 55.5. Uh, to uh, 19.9 millimeters. In conclusion, it is demonstrated that at the greenhouse level that the PGP earth and strain students uh, can be essential alternative for the biological control of the Risotonia solani compared to other commercial options. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think you are perfectly on time. And uh, now I would like to give the floor to our last speaker of the day, Mr. Rocha. He's going to talk something about biodiversity estimation work was done in Western Amazon, please. I think you need to unmute yourself. Julia, he is a co-host or not? No, we still, we still cannot hear you. Yes, I think it's so. okay. Yes. You can, all right. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, please. All right. 
Here is. Uh, is it okay position it? Uh, no, we don't see your slides yet. Um, okay, let me try again. Sorry for that. Um, okay, screen two. Um, okay, can you see my screen now? I think it's coming, yes. Is it perfect so uh, position it perfectly? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, all right, sorry for that. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the audience, wherever you are. I'm Fernando Iguini Rocha, I'm currently positioned as PhD candidate in agronomy, soil sciences by the Federal Rural University of Rio de Janeiro. I'm, I'm sorry to I'm disturb you. Today. I'm sorry, it's can I ask you? Sorry, can I disturb you? Do you have a two sorry? screen? Do you have a two screen or, or what? Yeah, I think exactly. you, are, you, are, you are sharing the wrong one. You should share another one. Uh, okay, let because me try we it are... again. Okay, now I'm trying to share, because I have two, um, two panels. One is to me and the other is No, now we are, we are still seeing the one you have a text, this one. Ah, okay, no, that's the wrong one. Yeah. Can you please tell me how can I fix it? You need to go you out know, of presenter mode, go to slideshow and, and take out presenter mode. Okay, stop sharing. Sorry for that. Then I can, I will, I'm gonna share my screen again. And then, Right. Is it okay right now? No, it's not coming. Oh gosh. Can someone please tell I can me share can the I presentation do? if you if you want. Yeah, but the presentation is a little bit different than I do really like to to present this current um yeah, it's coming i think presentation okay but i just need to can you no i i i think i think you should put your presentation first you have to oh. go out from the sharing right, screen okay. and put your slides the ppt in another screen and you when you share it you all right all right um, you need to choose me... which screen you, you want to share. Perfect. Uh, just me. Okay. Uh, presenter view. Um, okay. Sorry. Uh, Share screen. Can you see my presentation right now? Yes, now it's good, I think. Sorry, external. No, sorry go ahead. That. Go ahead. Okay, okay. So my challenge today is to succeed in sharing with some some the recent results of our research that tackle the importance of forest floor in biodiversity measurements for tropical forests, more specifically the Brazilian Amazonia. Uh, as everyone knows, the Amazonian rainforest is an extremely important biome for its high biodiversity and maintenance of essential resources for humanity. Um, however, the biome has been under intense anthropogenic pressure, especially for because of the conversion of forests to implement livestock production, which is reported as the main driver for increasing legal deforestation rates in recent years. Land use change directly affects the diversity, structure, and composition of soil microbial communities, and consequently, the ecological functions associated with these organisms, such as carbon sequestration, methane assimilation, and others. The land use change has influenced on different landscape scales, and consequently, affecting the ecological chain, food webs, 
and many other aspects of the ecosystem functioning. The more intense is the land use management, the more simplified is the system and higher is the cost and energy to recover the environmental stability as commonly reported. Speaking for papers using the keyword biodiversity, loss and tropical forests, only 5% of the results were related to studies that evaluated aspects of microbial diversity. That still point, points to, uh, to the low knowledge of this component of biodiversity that plays an undoubtedly important role. So to address some level of information in this topic, we explored the relationships between land use, soil types, and forest floor compartments on the prokaryotic meta-community structuring, which refers to the prokaryotic assemblies from geographically different sites in the Brazilian Western Amazonia. We hypothesized that the lower microbial alpha diversity of the forest soil reported in previous studies is a sampling artifact caused by the non-inclusion of the forest floor as a whole. That is, by not taking into account its organic layers. We also hypothesize that the inclusion of the organic layers is in the forest book soil suggests the biotic homogenization in pasture soils. The study uh, uh, was carried out in forest to pasture conversion areas in three regions throughout the states of Acre and Amazonas in the Western Brazilian Amazonia. These regions have soils originated from different pedogenetic process from the natural rich soil in the state of Acre to the wet red soils from the state of Amazonas. The studied sites are hotspots of biodiversity constantly affected by the advance of extensive livestock. Here I show some of the prof soil profiles covered in the land systems to touch on some of the pedological diversity included in this study. We collected soil samples in five forests and eight pastures using 200 meters transect with five equidistant points where each, each point four simple samples were collected to form a composite sample. The samples were divided to attend further soil characterization and also adequately stored for molecular analysis. And also we sampled the litter layer in the same way that has done for soil samples for both characterization and molecular analysis. Um, besides the, sorry, and, and yeah, sorry. Besides the chemical and physical characterization, we use the molecular methods to access the microbial, microbial community of the studied components, which is litter, root layers, and book soils through next generation sequencing using Illumina platform after all the steps of DNA extraction and quality checking. The sequences were subjected to bioinformatic analysis using the AD2 protocol developed by Callahan and collaborators to generate Amplicon single variants, which is an alternative to increase accuracy based in capability to reduce false positives estimator. Now I'm going to share some uh, results with you. The main fi findings confirm some assumptions that meta-community structure is significantly correlated to the increases in soil-based saturation and pH, showing that it shifted along a gradient of soil fertility from places with highly weathered soils, BAC and MAN, to those with high natural fertility, BUJ. However, all sites express the same response to ACV richness, which posi positively fall followed increases in soil pH ranging from forest to pasture. When considering the litter and root layers, it was possible to observe that the microbial structure in the litter has particular aspects in comparison to the other layers. However, the site that has soils with higher natural fertility show a shorter ecological distance between the microbial communities of the book soil and the organic layers. From the taxonomical aspect, we broaden the, the understanding of previous reports that show decreases in the relative abundance of protobacteria with the land use conversion and increases in actinobacteria. I won't go over the details, but overall, our results agree with previous re reports who found a higher beta diversity for soil prokaryotes in more altered land uses in Amazonia, 
such as pastors, especially for ASCV richness and channel diversity. And it was consistent in all the studied sites. Nonetheless, when we consider the layers of the forest floor as a whole, we can see that this environment is actually more taxonomically diverse than pastures, mainly due to the beta diversity, although the alpha diversity kept higher in pastures. This means that the spatial turnover on the forest floor gather more diversified microbial communities, also suggesting greater functional diversity, even though on different soil types. So including the evaluation of the forest floor as an adaptive environment, we noticed an input of soil biodiversity, reflecting that this biodiversity I saw are so far underestimated and declining while the deforestation rates are increasing in Amazonia rainforest. So here I conclude in saying that forest to pasture conversion determines critical changes in soil microbiota composition and structure, and then that the gradient of soil fertility determine variations community variations in community structuring the same land use system, and that the bacterial beta diversity increases when the forest floor is taken as a whole. It gives more evidence about the risks associated with the effects of forest to pasture conversion on maintaining soil multifunctionality in tropical ecosystem. And for those who are interested in above, I'd like to inform you that today our paper that addresses all the issues that were brought in here, will be available on frontiers in microbiology. This I appreciate in advance to everyone who will spend some time taking a look on it. Um, here I display the institutions I have been passing through and the financial support to this research. And I'd like to uh, thank my supervisors, Ederson Jesus, Vences Lau Teixeira, and all the, my work team uh, to allow me to participate in this research project. Muito obrigado, comunidade brasileira. Thank you everyone for the attention and sorry to my delay. Thank you very much, Mr. Rocha. And uh, I think it's very important uh, to bring this attention to our community. We really appreciate all the work you have done, all this profile you, you and your colleague have digging in the Amazon area, and we really appreciate that. I think now we can move to the question and the answer session. Uh, I saw a few questions uh, in the chatting set. There is uh, the first question, we'll go to our first speaker, uh, Ms. Shume, are you here? Here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there is a question asked, uh, what makes uh, urban soil specifically different from rural soil in terms of uh, biodiversity and agricultural characteristics? Please. Um, there are still a um, question about uh, differences between urban soil and agricultural soil, but um, concerning uh, the number of species and the abundance, especially for uh, organisms um, like Colombola, we have higher uh, biodiversity in urban soil than agricultural soil, but we have also a very different composition of species uh, with sometimes um, species which come from other country or species which come from um, other climate. Uh, for example, in Paris, we have a temperate climate, but we have often a species from Mediterranean uh, climate. Uh, so this, there is very difference uh, between composition in uh, rural and uh, urban soil, uh, and it's the same thing for the soil physical uh, quality. Uh, we have um, more contamination, but also more organic matter or more nutrient in urban soil. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the second question is for the, our second speaker, Mr. Brown. He's saying, uh, asking, given the pressure on aquatic biodiversity and ecosystem, is a fish bone meal really a good thing to ad, ad, advocate for soil fertility? Are there alternatives? Yes, uh, actually, I and thank you, Matthew. I answered that question directly to him, uh, but I will answer here in plenary. It actually, uh, any of these bone meals will be useful. Um, clearly, uh, this has been known for 
thousands of years, you know, native Amerindians and then even in North America use that, you know, by throwing a little bit of, of the bone meal into um, their, 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 their seed uh, planting um, in their plots. And yes, bone meal from any, any animal will, will, will work, but there are variations in that quality and chemical composition of those. And industrial uh, sources may be quite different from, from those, for instance, by home consumption, like that which was used in uh, Amazonian dark earth production. So um, there's clearly a niche for further work to be done here. And uh, I invite all of you of those interested in doing so in the future to answer that question as best as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see uh, that much uh, specific question for the Miss uh, Mamani Hoya, uh, but I believe uh, uh, you can also write your uh, email in the chat. If anybody has a questions, I think they can directly send a question to your email and then you can communicate with that. Uh, the last speaker, and uh, I think I also didn't have that much time for the audience to post the question. And actually I have a small question for you uh, because I'm, I'm trained as a pathologist. So I'm also deep, I have been, have been digging a lot of profiles. I know it's a lot of work when I saw your pictures with your colleagues. Uh, that's quite a lot of work. And I believe those data are very valuable. I'm just wondering if uh, there is, uh, for your uh, research domain, if there is any other way or concept or to think there is any faster in terms of the time and the cost efficient way to do this type of experiment for collecting the data and evaluating in a larger scale or not. Because in the end of the day, we, are, we need to do this to evaluate this biodiversity in a larger scale, because now you are doing a smaller scale to explore some ideas. And then later, on, I believe we need to uh, expand in a country scale or the continent scale, isn't it? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Mr. Peng. I guess this is an effort that should be made by many groups, uh, research groups. So I guess the most uh, easy uh, part of the work is analyze the data, but collecting all the sand soil samples and the organic layers uh, should be the more expensive and costly effort. So it needs to be a gather, gather many research groups and do it in different parts of a specific country or across a continent. And then working together, I guess we can uh, reduce costs to generate a valuable uh, amount of data. And then specific persons to analyze this and make some kind of um, pattern in, uh, between the data and generate some uh, uh, understandable results and to address this kind of uh, uh, this kind of research that tackle the amount of diversity that has been underestimated in organic layers across land use change uh, gradient. So I guess it's a matter of uh, working together and to collect samples and then uh, analyze this in uh, for specific uh, scientists, uh, data scientists, in etc. But the most expensive, costly, uh, for sure, is the is the, the trip to the soil collection. Yes, uh, the reason I ask you this question is actually because I'm working with a soil sensor. I'm trained as a pathologist, but I'm specialized in a soil sensor, the remote sensing, all these uh, techniques. And now there is a question asked in the chat: if a remote sensing technology can be used for for your research. Actually, I'm also uh, wanted to ask this question because the remote sensing in the remote space, uh, normally we only get uh, information from a very few centimeter of the soil. And uh, yeah. when we go to the deeper, and then it's getting difficult, especially in the Amazon area, we have a forest to cover. That will limit a lot of when, we, when we want to have uh, uh, deeper information. Of course, maybe some gamma ring can work, but that's going to be very expensive. So I don't know if you heard any 
research conducted by the remote sensing technology or proximal source sensing technology? Yeah, I guess uh, our work uh, has different aspect because most of the microbiology uh, reports don't uh, consider the soil taxonomy or the, the pedagogical uh, effort. We did it. And I, I do I believe that doing uh, remote sensing would be an extremely interesting tool, but so far we haven't a good uh, covering in soil types. If you took the, the past soil uh, surveys, probably you won't seek the correct soil types to connect with the microbial aspects. So now in Brazil, we have the prona solus, uh, which will be uh, an extremely interesting project, long-term project, which will help microbiologists to address both pedological aspects, chemical and physical characterization, and also the soil uh, microbial communities by the taxonomical and functional perspective. So we need to uh, gather this effort to address more uh, interesting and more important uh, issues for the humanity, in my perception at least. Thank you, thank you very much. I don't know if uh, other audience have uh, still have some questions uh, on today's uh, session or not. And, and actually, when we talk about uh, this uh, soil data, actually, just now I have uh, one question came out for the, our first speaker, uh, Miss uh, uh, Jome from France. If you are there. Yes, I'm here. Uh, uh, yes, I, I just would like to, because just now we were talking about uh, some sensing data uh, about uh, then I would like to ask you, because you mentioned just now the uh, in this uh, research community regarding the uh, biodiversity uh, urban micro farm, they have some lack of the reference value to evaluate actually the the biodiversity in the urban area. I'm just wondering, uh, is there any research approach or some study carried out uh, in this domain by the data driving, really combine different type of the data and evaluate this uh, biodiversity system actually? Um, in France, we have a network of uh, soil quality, but um, they are, concerned mainly forest and cultivated area and not uh, urban soil. We um, exchange uh, with these people in order to increase uh, urban soil data in the network. And uh, we have also um, a project conducted by other colleagues. Uh, they will um, uh, follow several cities in France in order to uh, obtain data uh, in cities, um, and um, I talk uh, often friends, but in fact, when you uh, regard um, the literature, um, there is uh, more study in urban soil in Europe, and there is uh, less study in other uh, region of the world. So I don't know um, how many species, how many difference there is uh, between uh, different cities in the, in the world. So it's also a limit of uh, studying urban soil. And the other problem is also uh, we had a great diversity of um, urban soil on the habitat, for example, it's very difficult to say, is this, uh, it is uh, this kind of habitat or this is a, a garden or it's a, Three, uh, it's very complicated because there is other factor. So I think it's one limit to, to have data on um, reference value. Uh, but I hope with the um, cost data for bad uh, presented in the, in the other session, I hope we have um, data on uh, urban soil and put on this uh, database in order to have a uh, reference value, in order to compare how we do it with a lot of data. So I hope the head of will uh, functioning. 
Thank you very much. Yes, I, I believe it's also very difficult to collect this type of the data. And also, I think this data is also changing over the time, depending on the climate or the condition. Yeah. Yes. And uh, yeah. it's different if you are on the ground or in Greenwood, it's not the same climate. And uh, uh, there is this kind, sometimes we call um, pseudo tropical bubble on uh, the site because we have a lot of rain, we have uh, um, a higher temperature. So it's very different from rural area, which can be very close, but it's not the same climate. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I saw, I think the last question, I saw there is a question to say, have, actually, I don't know, we didn't mention this question is for who? The question is, that, have there any developed soil sonography machine that we see live activity in soil? Do you, I don't know if any speaker knows <clears throat> this question is addressed specifically for who? No, for me, I don't. This is a question from Ganesh Baba. I think it would be wonderful if we had something that we could just put on top of the soil and tell, it, tell us the, what was in it, but uh, that Julie, seems a little bit panaceic for the meantime. Julie, <laughs> Julia, can you please, uh, I think uh, uh, Mr. Baba is uh, online. He's, I can see him, can you please unmute him? Probably he can say, he can say something about his question. Mr. Bavar, can you unmute yourself, please? Hello. Yes. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Uh, my, my question is there. How, how anyone uh, person develop uh, just sonography machine we see uh, in human bodies, all organs? That type uh, soil uh, biodiversity, uh, we see the lively, the earthworms, root growing structure, and microorganism, that type. We see the uh, layu presentation in the soil. Yes. Understand? You know, no. you know, son you know, sonography machine. Hello. Yes, we hear you, but uh, I think sonography sonography machine is uh, used for the human organs inside uh, human organs. Seeing layuli. That type, uh, I want anybody develop the machine to uh, see the layu uh, activities in the soil that is microbes and earthworms we see the on screen layuli I, I think you talk about tomography uh, in the soil the tomography we use uh, uh, we can go in a hospital with uh, our uh, soil plot and uh, we can uh, <laughs> um, you can take your uh, soil plot and you can go in a hospital and use a scanner and you can uh, see uh, the different uh, earth from burrows, for example, and, or plants and woods. I think you talk about that. Uh, uh, I want the uh, layu demonstration in the soil. Yes, the main difficulty with soil is that it's a solid medium and consisting mainly of solid particles. So it's not, uh, it's not like uh, our skin, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, also solid, but uh, composed of a lot of liquid. And therefore the ultrasound can, can show what, what, what's in there. It's very much more difficult to show what's in the soil uh, when it's a very compact and solid medium. That's why uh, Sophie mentioned the, the tomography which generally we do to see the remains of what the animals did. We can't see so much the actual animals themselves. And so we end up having this, this very, very difficult aspect of, of, of looking at only what was left over and not what was actually there working at the, at the time we wanted to see it. So right now, I don't think there's any equipment like that. It would be wonderful if there was. I would be one of the first users. Um, I'm sure many other people would like to use that also. But I don't think, uh, uh, you know, I think this is something more of an engineering question for somebody who has uh, more of that kind of background than for a soil zoologist. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Mr. Brown and uh, Ms. Jomen for helping answer this question. And thank you, everybody. I think uh, we are a few minutes, almost 10 minutes uh, uh, behind of the schedule. And uh, I believe we had a very nice discussion today. And uh, all the presentation, uh, I think I give a lot of information. And uh, I personally also learned a lot. And if we have, uh, if our audience, everybody, anybody has any questions, I believe uh, you can easily find the contact information of all the speakers. And I believe all the speakers will be more than happy to answer your question and help your work in your research or your, your agriculture work. So uh, we will have to, stop it from here today and uh, thanks again for all the speakers and the participants and thank you very much and have a good day thank you goodbye bye 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 thank you so much thank you so much thank you